<laughs> All right. Oh, yeah. Rep, yeah. Reputation is temporary, isn't it, bro? It sure is. Mm -hmm. I don't know if y'all know this, but I got two or three people help me preach regularly around here. Yeah. Billy Bryan and Bev and Lawrence. All bees. The killer bees. <laughs> Billy, Brian, and Bill, the killer bees. Yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, you know, sometimes you need a little bit of help around here. I don't guarantee you sometimes. Because good help, boy, you need, to, you, need, you need to move forward with some stuff. Yeah, that's exactly right, I tell you. Because we're in the book of Philippians, and uh, how many of you are getting anything out of the book of Philippians? Yeah, yeah, good. All right, a few, a few. Well, that's good. I mean, it's better than nobody, you know. <laughs> I'm kidding, y'all are good. I'm playing with you. I'm just complaining is what I'm doing. I'm just complaining, yeah. Yeah, yeah, last week we learned about complaining, right? Yeah. How many of you have been complaining more than ever this week since you learned about it last week? <laughs> I found mine. I'll tell you what, I don't know if I'm complaining more, but I sure am noticing it more. <laughs> anyway, let's put it that way. I, uh, I find myself, I know it, man, I find myself, I'll be you know, getting negative about things or complaining about something that's, uh, that, that, that I, here's the thing about, yeah, here's the thing about complaining. Complaining, I mean, we are the, we are blessed by the Lord. Our life, we, we're going to go to heaven when we die. We have a Holy Spirit living in us right now. We're empowered by a power that's higher than ourselves. Yeah. We're, we're, given, uh, we're given a sense of direction by the Holy Spirit inside of us. Uh, we're, we're, you know, now, we don't have to obey it, and a lot of times we don't obey it, but the point is, is that it's there, and God has a purpose, and he moves us toward that purpose, and, and, and even though we don't know everything about everything right at the moment, we know that we're headed somewhere because God created us for something, and we have a purpose. And he's promised to be with us and never to leave us. And he said, if your yoke is heavy, put it on me because my yoke is heavy and burden is light. And, and I'll bear all your burdens and carry all your sorrows. I mean, he just says all kind of great things to us. And of all people on earth, we should be the most thankful and grateful people in the world. But yet, if we're not careful, we'll end up whining and complaining and becoming a martyr and being cynical and like everybody else in the world all the time. And so Philippians reminded us, just as a reminder to you, um, hey, watch, watch, look at this. Notice this. Uh, the, God, God, does, God intends for his people to be different from this. The you know, world pushes us in certain ways. The reason I'm saying all that about last week is because the same will be true this week. I don't know if you've looked at your notes. If you have, you've probably seen what we're, what we're dealing with this week, and it's one of those things that, um, although it's talking to men, and I'm using men because the Bible in Philippians uh, identifies two men in Paul's life that he commends and says great things about, and so it's really about men, but ladies, this could be you too, all right? This is not just a message for men this Sunday. It, it really pertains to all of us in life, but especially men. You know, guys, if you've, been, if you've been wondering what you should be and how you should be and what the Lord would expect out of you, here it is. If you've been wondering what will make me a good hub, husband, what will get my life straightened out, I'm just as crooked as a as the devil's backbone. What, what is, what is going to get me straightened out in life? Here, here it is, all right? Here, here's a notable uh, effort at the Holy Spirit speaking into your heart about what it takes to be a real man and what it takes to make a difference in the world because I'm going to tell you something. This crazy world we're living in, it's going to take a real man to make a difference. It's going to take real people to make a difference, male or female. You're going to have to be... You're going to have to be what the Lord created you to be if you're going to make a difference. And I'm not just talking about, quote, the world. I mean, very few of us are going to make a difference in the world. I mean, the world is just gigantic. And, you know, I mean, uh, Mother Teresa, Billy Graham, people like that might make a difference in the world. Doubtful whether you will make one in the world. But you have a world. 
and the world you live in, which after all is the most important one, right? <laughs> yeah, the one I wake up in every day is the one I'm really concerned about, really. I mean, at least initially I'm most concerned about my world. And so if you're going to change your world, uh, your family, your neighborhood, your work group, uh, you know, your life personally. How do you do that? What is that all about? Well, it takes these things that Paul's about to say to us in this second chapter of Philippians. Boy, this book is so rich. It's the joy book, right? And it's about being joyful in the Lord. It's about why we can be joyful in the Lord and how to be joyful in the Lord. I know, you know, uh, sometimes we might have a hard time being joyful because we get all bent out of shape over trivial things and we lose perspective and we don't think about how great all the things of God are. But here they are as a reminder in Philippians. Let me just read you some verses. I, I very seldom do this. I usually just kind of stop along the way. But I'm gonna, I want to read all the verses to you at first and then we'll come back and we'll look at some stuff. All right, but beginning in verse 19 of chapter 2, Philippians. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. Now, you, you do remember Paul is separated from the church because the church is in a little place called Philippi, and Paul is sitting in jail in Rome. He's sitting in prison. He'll never get out of that prison, by the way, and he'll end up with his head chopped off. At, at the end, that's what most of the historians think happened to the Apostle Paul. Uh, we know he wasn't crucified because he refused to be. Uh, he didn't want to be crucified like Jesus, no. Uh, and he, plus, he was a Roman citizen. Then he didn't, anyway, but, but that you may be also encouraged when I know your state. You see, I just ramble off. Uh, verse 20, for I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus, but, but you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. So Paul's still saying, hey, I'm really believing I'm going to get to come see you guys, you know. Lord willing, I'm going to, I'm going to be there. I want to see you. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, brother with a strange name, right? Epaphroditus. Everybody say Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus. Okay, no, nobody's name Epaphroditus in this room, right? <laughs> okay, didn't think so. Yeah, yeah, or anywhere else that we know. Your brother was a strange name, but he, he's, he's good as gold. Now watch, watch what it says about him. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need. Epaphroditus was the one that Philippi sent with all the resources they had gathered to go take care of Paul while he's in prison because they all couldn't go and they just took up an offering and sent some things that would comfort him and make him more comfortable and make it better for him. And Epaphroditus went and took these things. And, and just so you, you know that it wasn't like, okay, we're going to get in our automobile and drive down about three or four blocks to the prison down there and, and you know put it in. Since he was longing for you all and was distressed because... You had heard that he was sick, for indeed he was sick, almost unto death. But the Lord had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Saul said, man, if he had died bringing that stuff to me, I don't know if I could have gotten over that. That man is so faithful, and he was so sick, but thank the Lord he didn't die, because that would have been just too much for me to handle. Therefore, I send him the more eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in esteem. That's a good word, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. When's the last time you heard that whole, uh, this man's worthy of being held in, in high esteem? Look at him with some honor in your face when you look at him because he deserves to be honored. Because for the work of Christ, he came close to death, not regarding his life to supply the help you yourselves could not give. All of you guys in the church of Philippi couldn't come down here to the prison house and bring me stuff. So he stood for you. He took your place and, and ministered to me when the rest of you, even though you might have wanted to, you could not do that. And he is a man of great faith and great, great example here. 
you know, men are something, aren't they? Do you ever, do you, do you look at men nowadays? Uh, not really. It's kind of tough, is it? It is kind of tough. But, you know, the thing about it is if you look at the role models that guys of today have, it's amazing that they're even as good as they are. Because our old crazy world has some tremendously ridiculous role models for what it is to be a man. And I'm telling you, it's been going on for years and years and years because when I mention a few of them, you're going to laugh because it'll show you how old I really am. Because some of the kids may not have ever even heard of a few, of, a couple of these guys that I might mention. The first one is the Macho Maniac. The Macho Maniac. Now, if you look at your notes, I really tried to describe him as best as I could. These guys deny all of their feelings except rage. Now, they're, they're full of rage and full of fury. And they, and, they, and they fight at the drop of a hat, and, they're, and they justify their rage. They have no other feelings except that. They ignore the law, never worry about anything, never complain. Of course, they also never apologize about anything. The macho maniac takes what he wants. Violence is his answer to everything. And, and I put in, he sweats a lot. Um, I mean, <laughs> that's just for your information, you know. Yeah, this, this is the macho maniac. These are people like Dirty Harry, uh, the Terminator, you know, Schwarzenegger, I'll be back. Um, Rambo, Rambo is one of them. Uh, uh, Charles Bronson, if you guys, some of you grew up with watching his revenge shows. Uh, the movies Taken would be a perfect example of this kind of a guy. You know, I mean, these are the, these are the silent, no frills type of guy that just believes in, in going in and taking what you're wanting and let the chips fall where they may and everybody get out of the way. And, and, and they're not, they, they really escape reality that way. And, and, and they're constantly in turmoil because they're always looking for the next villain to fight, even if there's not one there. All right. So the macho maniac. The second type of man that we see as role models today is, I call them the great pretender. The great pretenders are people, and I, when I say his name, you're going to go, who? Archie Bunker was a great <laughs> pretender. Do any of you remember Archie Bunker? Archie Bunker sat on the throne of his house. He was the dumbest man you've ever seen in your life. He thought he was in control of everything, but his family behind the scenes just laughed at him and ridiculed him because they saw how ridiculous he really was. And even though he thought that he was the king of his own castle, he really never ran anything because his family constantly outsmarted him and did whatever they wanted to. And the way he, he uh, dealt with people is by being obstinate and being loud and being angry all the time. Yeah, we call him the great pretender. Uh, let's see, I wrote one. Oh, Chico and the Man. Do any of you ever remember Chico and the Man? Yeah, Freddie Prince and, and the old man, old grouchy man that ran the garage and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that, that kind of Sanford and Son. Anybody remember Sanford and Son? Oh, yeah. Old Fred and Lamont and the Sanford boy. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm on, what would he say? Uh, uh, Esther was one. He always had the trouble. <laughs> Esther. <laughs> Esther. It's coming, Esther. Yeah, all right. So that's a pretender. So these, these, are, these are models of manhood. These are men that society have put forth and put in our faces and said, if you want to be a man, be like this. This is what being a man is really all about. And then here comes the third one, the world-class wimp. Now, you could just take any, any man from any sitcom from the middle 1980s until now, and he would be the world-class wimp. I don't know what it was, but in, about, in the middle 1980s, um, TV decided and society decided that it was funny to make fun of Dad, and that Dad would, was most often portrayed as being the dumbest one in the family. He didn't know what was going on. The kids were always much smarter than Dad, and they always had to fix everything that Dad did because Dad was not even smart enough to know that it was really wrong what he was doing. So the super intelligent kids who ran the family took care of poor old daughter and ignorant dad. 
And that was family. Look, I, I didn't grow up with that. I grew up with strong dad. I grew up with father knows best. Any of you heard about that? I grew up with leave it to Beaver, Ward Cleaver and the boys, man. Now, these people were single, these people were single dads, yet they didn't have any of that trouble like that. Uh, ben Cartwright had no trouble out on the Bonanza, you know. <laughs> No women ever came out there and tempted him and all of that. And if they did, they were always ushered right off the show real quick. You know, I mean, he was, I mean, he was a single dad, but he had it all together and all that, you know. And those were the days that we grew up in. Fred McMurray and my three sons seemed to really do all right, you know. And, and uh, it, those were the images, but all of a sudden it changed, and now we have the world-class women. You see, this is why I'm saying the model of manhood, the men that we have today are reflective of the models that they have demonstrated for them for the past 35 years or more, guys. I mean, it's no wonder that men are the way they are. And here's the last one. Uh, just see him, the gender blenders. Yeah, the gender blenders. Man, what are they, a man or a woman? I don't know. I mean, see, we grew up with weirdos like Alice Cooper, but you knew he was a man. <laughs> even, though he, even though he wore makeup and looked raggedy, he was, a, he was a man. By the way, did you know Alice Cooper's saved now and really speaks for the Lord? Yeah, he ministers for the Lord. Yeah, oh, Alice, crazy old Alice Cooper. Dead babies don't cry and all that. School's out for summer and all that. Yeah, those were guys. David Bowie, who's dead now, he was one of those that looked like a woman and you know, it's kind of started a little bit of a trend. Boy George, boy, you know, boy George, a freak out, something, you know, that kind of weird and all that kind of stuff. Michael Jackson, what sex was he? Marilyn Manson. I mean, you see, these are the, I mean, these are the thing, these are the predecessors of people that have slowly but surely over a period of time said, look, it's not really important to be masculine or feminine. You know, you just need to be, you could be like, um, you know, androgynous here. You know, uh, if, you, if you're androgynous, which means, by the way, neither male nor female. Uh, if you're androgynous, you're not a threat to anybody and nobody's going to get offended and nobody's going to get their feelings hurt because you're not acting like a man as if there's something wrong with being a man and being what God created a man to be. So our world has tried to shape us, and I'm just saying to you young guys, I'm just surprised you're as far along as you are with, with role models like this in your life. The Apostle Paul gives us two examples of real men in these passages that we read. So if you want to know what God expects out of a man and the kind of man that God is looking for, and if you say, I want to be the kind of man that God is looking for, then I'll show you about five things here that he says in this passage to give us an, an idea of what God considers a real man. All right? You ready for that? All right. Well, let's just see the first one. All right? God's looking for men of compassion. These are men who put people before prophets. People before prophets. Look at this passage. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly that I also may be encouraged when I know your state, for I have no one like-minded who, who will sincerely care for your state, for all of them seek their own and not the things which are of Christ. What, 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 what is God saying? He's saying over the long haul of life, relationships are much more valuable than things. And what God is looking for in the overhaul of life is God is looking for compassionate men. Do you hear me? I said compassionate men. Look, look in your notes right there in the center of that verse. Compassion can be described as protecting the needs and rights of others. So often we're, totally, we're so totally into ourselves that we don't even know what's happening with other people. The Lord's looking for a person of compassion who cares about people more than he cares about the profits of his life. What does, what does Corinthians tell us about life? 1 Corinthians 13, you remember it's the love chapter. In the love chapter, what does it say? Doesn't it say something like this? Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and I don't have love, 
I'm I'm a clanging I'm a, I'm a clanging brass I mean a clanging brass uh, uh, a sounding brass and a clanging signal symbol. In other words, I'm noise in the house. That's all it is. You know, just indiscriminate noise if I'm not full of love. And it says, look, if I don't have compassion and I don't care for my brothers and sisters, and I'm not, you know, I, even though I might have everything in the world, even I, though I might know everything in the world, even though I might give myself to be burned for everybody in the world, and I have not love, what does he say? I am nothing. That's exactly right. I am nothing in this world. So the man who is wrapped up in himself is not a daddy. He's a mummy. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. I have to entertain myself every now and then. <laughs> yeah, but God's looking for a compassionate man, a man who is a man who cares about other people. And what does he say about Timothy? He says, look, I'm sending Timothy because I don't have anybody else in my life that's like Timothy who's going to come down there and take care of you without worrying about himself because he doesn't worry about himself. He worries about what's going on with you. He's not trying to build a kingdom. He's not trying to take over a church. He's not trying to be the pastor of some big gigantic thing. He's not trying to run people off. He's trying to minister to needs. And so God says, you know what I need? I need men of compassion. Secondly, consistency. Men who put character before conformity. Now, here's what I'm talking about with consistency, really. I'm talking about men that don't change all the time. Men you can count on to be the same tomorrow as they are today. And next week, you know, you can't build a family if dad's not consistent. Because what happens if, you, if dad's not consistent, the whole family's unstable. I mean, he's unstable, and he creates a, in his wife an unstable sense, and then they create... Insecure children because the children don't ever know what to expect when dad walks in the door right. or what's going on in life. So, what I'm talking about when I say consistency, I'm talking about men who have a character, a character in life that creates consistency in them. In other words, they stand for something. Yeah. What's the old line in the country song that came from old line on the refrigerator? You got to stand for something or you'll fall for anything. Yeah. Thank you, brother. <laughs> See, Brian helping me preach. Yeah. So, so, so when I see the word, when I see the word consistency and I see the word character, I, I, words like integrity, words like conviction come, come into my thought. Uh, it takes it takes men of commitment to make a difference in in your world, in the world you live in. Uh, how many of you ladies would like to be married to a man that's pretty pretty consistent? Yeah. He's pretty consistent. Yeah. Or how about this one? Well, I tell you what, my husband's pretty committed. You like to be married with somebody that's pretty committed? I mean, what does that mean? It means well, he only. You know, he only slips off probably two or three times a month. He's, but he's pretty consistent, I'm telling you. He's a pretty good old boy. No, you, you, want, you don't want pretty committed. That's like being pretty pregnant. How, you know, <laughs> you are either, you ain't no pretty pregnant out here. You either, you either is or you ain't. That's exactly right. And so God is looking for a man whose, whose character is, is built within him and whose life stays the same consistency because of his character. Look at this. But I know, but, but, but you know of his proven character. What does that mean? Proven character. It means his character has been put to a test. That's right. That's right. I mean, I, I, you, you can't have a proven character if that character hadn't been tested. You, have, you could have character, but it's not proven until it gets proven. And of course, what Paul's saying here is, look, I've proven, man, Timothy's character has been proven many times over and over and over. I'm just saying to you, like a father with a son, I've been there with him a lot of times. He's been a lot of places with me. We've been through a lot of battles, a lot of fights, and I can tell you one thing, buddy, his character is proven, and he's going to be consistent, and you can count on Timothy. That's why I'm sending him up there to you. Trust him, man. He's a great guy. So God's looking for good men like that, men of consistent character. Here's the third thing, cooperation. Men of cooperation. 
Men who put cooperation before competition. One of the problems that we have in families nowadays is the same problems that we have in church a lot. We're all in competition with each other. One of the reasons I think that the church hasn't gone further than it has in the past 2,000 years is because we won't cooperate with each other. We have our own little kingdoms built up with our own little uh, uh, goals in mind. And we're all pushing for our own little kingdom instead of God's kingdom. It's our kingdom. And we all push in opposite directions. Look here what Timothy, I mean, what, what uh, Paul says to Philippians. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. Now notice what he says. My brother. Look at him, the way he's describing him. He said, I'm going to send Epaphroditus. My brother. Yeah. My fellow worker. My fellow soldier. Mm-hmm. What are words like that? Words like that are words of cooperation, Right. right. I mean, this guy's part of something, the same thing I am. When he says, he's my brother, what is he implying? We're, we're in the same family. That's one of the reasons why we in church call each other brother all the time, except for the fact that we can't remember somebody's name. <laughs> nice to meet you, brother. Nice to meet you, brother. I can't remember your name, but brother will be it. But we call each other brother, you know, 133 times. I know that seems tinky, you know, because like who counts them? But 133 times in the New Testament, Paul uses the term brother. It's a, it's a family term. And what he's saying is, he says, look, we, Epaphroditus is a man who can cooperate. He's a man who can be part of my family, part of your family. He doesn't have his own agenda. He has a, he's for the family. And thank God that he's put us together and we are a family. I've said that before to all of you and we've talked about it before. One of the great things about Freedom River is I really feel this totally is we're a family. Yeah, same goal, same same purpose. We got a lot of weird little kids and stuff. But that's (laughs) that's all right. Virginia said, don't talk about me like that. But that's right. And then he says, my fellow worker. So he's talking about the fact that we have the same task. We have the same assignment. We're working on the same job. We're cooperating with each other to get the work done. So he's not only a family member, but he's, a, he's somebody that works on the same task that I work on, and he's somebody trying to get the same job done. And then the last one, and, and, and a fellow soldier. In other words, yeah, in other words, we're fighting a battle, right? We have an enemy that fights against us at all times, an enemy that comes against us every day of our life, an enemy that wants to destroy our life, destroy our family, destroy our church, destroy our children, destroy our environment. We have an enemy, and we're in a war. We're in a battle. Look at your neighbor and say, we're in a fight. Now, I know everybody doesn't realize that, but it's the truth. We are in a fight. And so the Apostle Paul says, I'm telling you, Epaphroditus is a guy that can cooperate, buddy. You can count on him because he's one of your fellow soldiers. He's got your back. He'll watch after you. And he won't put a knife in it either, you know. He'll watch your back. He'll protect you. He'll defend you. You know, one of the things that families do and one of the things that regiments do and one of the things that soldiers do for each other is they protect each other. They stand for each other. They guard each other's lives. When they see danger, they point it out and say, hey, man, don't go that way. Look, you know, and they and and they protect. And so the Apostle Paul is just saying, look, man, you're going to have to be a man of cooperation rather than everything being competition in your life. You are not competing with your family, guys. You are serving your family. Your family is what God has given you to be an overseer of and to, and to lead that family through some minefields of life. And to be a, the kind of man that God considers a man, you're going to have to be a man of character that takes you forward so that you're not flipping and flopping and changing and moving every day and nobody knows who you are or what you think or how you're going to be when you get home or whatever you have about life. And you're going to have to, and you're going to, have to walk with some, with some cooperation in life, yeah, yeah. not fighting everything. Mm-hmm. 
being bombastic and paranoid, you know, in life. Yeah. Not getting out there on that island by yourself and saying it's me against the world kind of malarkey. No, if it is, you're a dead man. You got to get in the get in the family. All right, let me give you another one. Commitment. Men who put the cause of Christ before comfort. I know this might sound an awful lot like consistency because I use the word commitment in consistency. It's hard to talk about being consistent without being committed. But here I'm talking about just a little different flavor of consistency. I'm talking about you are going to have to believe that what you are doing has a purpose beyond you. You're going to have to be committed to something that you can't see the end of, but that you have been promised is there and you know is necessary. The Epaphroditus was sent to, to the Apostle Paul in Rome just, just to show you what kind of commitment I'm talking about. The Apostle Paul was in Rome in jail, 800 miles away is Philippi, 800 miles away in those days. In those days, it took six months to go 800 miles, at least, right, Lawrence, walking in a ship, in a boat, in a whatever you, you might be able to find. It wasn't going to be popping the automobile, turn the air on, and let's go down there and see. So Epaphroditus is 800 miles away, and he's been commissioned by his church with a, with a, with a deed. And the deed is the Apostle Paul needs you. The Apostle Paul needs these things. We're putting them, in this, we're putting them in, this, in this box and we're loading it on you because you are going to represent us and you're going to go down and take care of these needs. And this is very important and vital that you get there. Will you take this? And Epaphroditus said, I'll take it. And he became a man of commitment because according to the scriptures, you remember we read them and I know it just a moment ago and you saw them. You know, he said, uh, Paul said, all right, he, he, he's my brother, he's my fellow worker, and he's my fellow soldier. And the rest of that verse says, but your messenger. To me, he's a fellow soldier. To me, he's a fellow worker. To me, he's a brother. But to you, he's your messenger and the one who ministered to my need. Now, just notice what he did. Since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. So somewhere along the way in this 800 miles, Epaphroditus gets sick. Now, just so you won't think that doesn't mean anything, let me just tell you, the word in, in, in the scripture that is used for sick right here is the same word that was used when they talked about Lazarus being sick. Remember, Lazarus died, right? That's pretty sick, right, wouldn't you say? Uh, Dorcas, you remember Dorcas that Peter raised from the dead? She, it, she was sick with this sick, just like this too, by the way. So I'm just telling you, this was serious sickness. I'm telling you, this was not like, oh, he woke up one day, you know, with a sour stomach or something. I'm telling you, you know, this is sick unto death. And, and yet, and yet but even being sick unto death, Epaphroditus doesn't stop the job. He still keeps moving forward no matter how sick he got. And Apostle Paul said, you heard that he was sick, and he's worried about you being all upset because you didn't know what happened to him and how he was doing and all of that. For indeed, he was sick almost to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but me too, because I would have just I'd have fell out if he died. I, I couldn't have handled it, Paul said. I just, that would have been just way past anything I could handle if Epaphroditus died coming down here to minister to me. Because that's a good man. That's a good man, y'all. And so, and, so, and so commitment means that, that, I, that, I, that I place others and I place, I place assignments 
over myself. In other words, God is looking for men who are willing to pay the price. Willing to pay the price. Is having a family difficult? You bet. Are rearing children in these days, is that hard? You bet it is. Is working hard enough and trying to make enough money to, to provide a home and, and, some, uh, and some comforts of life and some food? And, I mean, is that hard to do? Man, yes, it's hard to do. Some of, them, some of the guys have to work two or three jobs. Yeah. I work two myself. Mm-hmm. Some of you work way more than me. But you do it because you're willing to pay the price. Yeah. Because the prize is worth the price that you're having to pay. You drive around in old raggedy 20-year-old pickups. You wear clothes that are out of style and out of date that everybody kind of snickers at when you walk by. But, but, but you do that so that you can provide for them to have the best and for them to make it ahead in life because life's not all about you. Now, that's a man. In spite of the fact that he almost died, he didn't stop going. He didn't look around and say, what kind of excuse can I have not to go to work today? Mm-hmm. I'm trying to f- find some way to skip work. I don't, you know, I'm tired. I stayed up too late last night. Meh, 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 meh. No, man, you hook up. A man is willing to pay the price, and God said, that's the kind of men I'm looking. Hey, the Marines stole the phrase from God, looking for a few good men. I mean, they... They did. That came from God right there. I, I guarantee you. All right, so there we go. Here's the last one. Courage. Courage. <laughs> I thought about, thought about the line. <laughs> did you? Yeah. Courage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> y'all don't know what you... Some of y'all have never seen The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> you don't know. You don't know the cowardly line on The Wizard of Oz. Put him up. Put yeah, I got to come back. Mm. Men of courage, men who put service, uh oh, put service before sincerity, security, excuse me. I know I always hook that thing. Let me give you verse 29 and 30. The cowardly line got me off track. All right. Receive, listen, receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in esteem. Isn't that something? You know, there's some guys in this church that should be held in esteem. That's right, that's right. I mean, when they walk in, you ought to kind of snap to attention just a little bit. I know a few. Yeah, your eyes ought to to be uh, looking at them with some honor. And you ladies too, believe me, you said here, I was talking about all, both of you. Yeah. But men, service That's it. demands, yeah. I mean, service produces uh, an honor and, and, and an esteem. And the Apostle Paul says, look, man, when he comes back, don't look at him like he's just another somebody standing around there. Give Look at him as a, as a man of esteem. And he said, not, on, not him, not just him, but people who are like him. Yeah, yeah. Look at those guys with some worthiness in your heart. Because, man, they've given their life so that the gospel of Christ can go forward. Yeah. They've given up their riches. They've given up their careers. They've given up their lives. They've given up lucrative uh, adventures. For the cause of Christ. And he said, don't just look at them as little stumble bums stumbling in off the street. Those guys, are, those guys are champions. Those guys are heroes. Look at them. Hold them in esteem because for the work of Christ, he came close to death not regarding his own life to supply the help you yourselves couldn't give. He went beyond the measure. Yeah. Which is what? The Bible teaches us that we are to do in life, right? Yeah, yeah. There's a book that Paul wrote, one of the, I think, if y'all want to, maybe in two or three years from now, <laughs> when we get through with this book and <laughs> Revelation, we might just go into Romans. I'll tell you, Romans is one of the greatest theological books that you, we have in our Bible. It probably is the greatest. 
It is unbelievable what Paul teaches in the book of Romans. It's phenomenal. But one of the things that he says in Romans, I know you'll remember it. I put it on a slide for you. Look at this verse. Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know what that's saying, guys? It's saying God does not intend for us to be pushed into the mold of the world, to conform to the mold of the world. Now, I know we're living in a world that, is, that pushes us every day to be conformed to it, pushes us every day to think like it thinks, to act like it acts, to say what it says is okay. But God says what we are to do is to resist being shaped by the concepts and thoughts of this world and let our mind be changed and transformed by the renewing of ourselves in Christ. And that we are to walk according to the things of God and, 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 and when we're not conformed to the image of this world, we present ourselves... Now get the concept. We present ourselves as living sacrifices yeah. to God. To which Paul says, that's your reasonable service. It's not unreasonable to, for God to ask you to do this. Right, he died for you on a cross. He gives everything for you. He provides for you. He loves you. He cares for you. He, he dwells within you. He moves you. He motivates you. He provides for your life. And it's not unreasonable for him to say, will you live for me? Will you be a living sacrifice for me? Do you know what the trouble with living sacrifices is? They keep crawling off the altar. They crawl on on Sunday and crawl right back off on Monday. They join the army on Sunday and they go AWOL on Monday. I mean, you know, uh -huh. that's not what God's looking for. What God's looking for is somebody to get on, that, get on that altar as a living sacrifice and stay on that altar as a sacrifice and say, God, whatever you have for me, here I am. Pour it on me. I want to be your man. I want to be a man for my family. I want to be a man for my children. I want, I want my children to have somebody to look up to in life. Somebody to trust in life. I want them, when they say the word daddy, that it means something yeah, to them. Yeah. That all of a sudden a little glee comes in their eyes and something comes in their heart when they hear daddy. When they hear the word daddy, they say everything's going to be all right. Yeah. yeah. That's, what, that's what God intends for a man to be. And this is how you become that dad. Matter of fact, let me, let me just show you one other thing and I'm finished. And this is just a passage, all right? Look at this. We had not seen this passage in a long time. 2 Chronicles 16 Verse 9 tells you what God's looking for. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. Don't you see the picture of that? Don't you see God looking over the, you know, we all have concepts of heaven that are probably all super phony, but because it's not like we think, I'm sure. But like him looking over, you know, the sides of heaven and, and his eyes and his eyes are just roaming like that. Just roaming to and fro. Yeah, yeah. Looking for somebody to show himself strong in. The only thing God needs to show his power to this world is somebody to show it in. Mm -hmm. Somebody that needs it. You know one reason we don't get more miracles than we get? Because we don't need them. You know why? Because we handle everything. We don't need a miracle. We do it ourselves. When you get in a spot where you need a miracle, God says, hey, my eyes are just running this earth to and fro, just looking for a chance to show myself strong in your behalf. Guys, that's the God that's backing us up. That's the God, that's the God that says, I got you back. You can let go. Why don't you just stand at your feet?